So Perfect. good morning, good morning, everybody. Nice to see you again, and uh, ciao, Donata. Nice to see you today. Um, well, why we're here today? So just to to make a little bit of summary of what we did in the last two meetings, we started with uh, uh, sharing uh, the lean approach, how you should uh, develop uh, your assumptions to build your startup. So how you need to use the Lean Canvas tool that it's uh, something very useful if you would like, uh, especially to increase the rate of survival uh, for your startup, uh, testing your assumptions and uh, getting uh, in the market your disruptive technology. Then we passed through the, in the last uh, meeting, uh, the value proposition canvas, which is uh, very linked to the Lean Canvas, which is very focused on one of the first achievement you need to achieve with your startup, which is the problem solution fit. So basically the main two assumptions of your Lean Canvas, which are the problems that you're solving for your customers and who are your customers. And basically if the solution you're developing, it's sticking with specific problems that your customers are suffering from. Um, before getting into this uh, presentation of today, which is basically focus uh, on uh, creating a fundraising plan with a focus on uh, the risk capital investors, which are, I would say, relevant actors that uh, can support, uh, especially early stage startups uh, for financing uh, their uh, early stage. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, because you know, uh, we shared, uh, I think Nora and Giacomo did this, uh, the template of the value proposition canvas. So for the ones that already participated last meeting, uh, I would like to ask if you were able to fill uh, your uh, value proposition canvas because uh, as we did last time, the idea is to dedicate 15, 20 minutes, uh, depending on how many you have, for uh, reviewing the value proposition canvas of your startups. Okay, so re to receive uh, feedback and so also let the others understanding how to properly fill it. So I don't know if some of you fill this out. So in case, please uh, let me know. Maybe you can write in the chat or whatever, or you can mute yourself. Because just to understand if we can, uh, you know, um, review some of the value proposition canvas, or in case we need to go on with the with the presentation. So please, in case, write in the chat or unmute yourself. But I don't see, you know, no responses. So maybe we can just keep uh, the presentation. And then in case uh, if uh, somebody will uh, write or, you know, unmute yourself, uh, I will, uh, you know, give the priority for the review of the value proposition canvas, okay? So just That's not perfect. To... Okay. Thank you so much, Lorenzo, yes. Okay, so now just let me start with the presentation. So, uh... Here we are. So which, which are the main contents of today? So a little bit just to anticipate uh, before. Um, it's important uh, to understand, well, when you are getting out of this meeting today, I hope that you will get uh, properly uh, the right, uh, let's say, knowledge on how you need to set up your fundraising of your startup uh, and uh, which are the main, uh, let's say, tip tips that you should take into consideration to properly send up and execute your fundraising. It's, again, not rocket science, are just tips from the ground, but it's very important that, you know, after today, you learn something that could be useful for you in executing this fundraising strategy. Um, as, let's say, introduction, as I did for the last two meetings, I would like to start with the pain, with a, I would say, relevant pain, which you may pass through, which is that fundraising is very challenging. Um, you know, whatever moment of your startup, you will need money until uh, you will reach uh, your profitability. This means that you are able to generate profit that can sustain the growth of your company. But until that moment, you will need money for boosting 
and scaling uh, your business. So some of these questions have been raised in your mind. So how much money do I need to raise to reach the next milestones? Which is the best source of money? Because as you may know, there are different stakeholders, investors, kind of investors that can put money to boost your specific business. And when I should start to raise money, this is another important question because the momentum that you need to raise your money, it's something crucial. We will see this starting too late could uh, force you to accept conditions that are not, uh, let's say, fair. And then uh, your uh, fundraising strategy would not be, let's say, optimal. Okay, so we will see this in the next slide. Questions before starting? Something that you would like to add on top of these uh, specific uh, things that you would like to add on, uh, you know, the fundraising plan? Again, please interrupt me when uh, we are going through the presentation. You know, it's an interactive session. So whatever kind of things that you would like to ask add uh, during the the, the presentation, please unmute yourself or write in the chat, okay? So why are you raising money? So this is, I would say, something that uh, most of you will know, of course. Uh, you start your journey, setting up your startup. You have starting test assumptions, as we see in the link canvas. So you will have a specific moment of your business journey where the revenues basically will be lower than the cost, okay? This is normal. So and in this, let's say, moment, it's where, you know, you are in the debt valley, basically, because in this specific, you know, uh, stage, uh, most of the startups are failing uh, because it's tough, the journey, you're not seeing results, maybe. So this is the early stage, uh, and there are different kind of investors, especially in the risk capital industry, which can support you. We will see this in detail, just to a little bit debrief everybody if you're not acquainted with this. Are, for example, angels, could be early stage funds. In this stage, also there could be family and friends, some that give you money. And until you're not, you're not achieving the break even, which is basically the revenues of your business are matching your cost, then once you achieve this, you will become profitable. But then, of course, if you would like to boost your specific growth, because your organic growth, it's not helping you to boost as you would like to, then, of course, you need to look also for other kind of money, which is more for the later stage. And in this case, you can look for other kind of investors. Always in the risk capital industry, there are different kind of investors in the pipeline. This could be venture capitalists, private equity players, and then you can raise money. Of course, the amount of money, it's changing because of course, if you need to grow in the early stage, you need an amount of money for reaching the milestone, which is lower. Then of course, the more you are growing, the more you are getting, uh, let's say, uh, bigger in terms of revenues of um, dimension, the more also uh, the, uh, the other rounds that you will raise. Last but not least, uh, the difference of the need of money in the early, in the seed capital, as you can see, block, uh, it's because you need to reach your profitability, the break-even. Once you reach the break-even, all the rounds after are for boosting your specific growth. Because the organic growth that you may reach with your profitability, it's not enough for boosting the, uh, the growth that you're expecting, your investors are expecting, okay? So the main reason you are raising money for is for growing, okay? So you're burning your capital, you're burning your money in order for making investment that will help you to get bigger and bigger, to growth and match the expectations also of the investors that are supporting you. Because we will see this in a moment, 
when you're bringing on board investors, and I'm speaking about risk capital investors, you need to match their expectations when they are supporting you. And one of these expectations is that you start to grow and you will grow in a specific time frame that will repay them for the risk they taken before. So good and bad news, there are a lot of funding opportunities outside today. So if you start to scout on the web, uh, you will have tons of players that can give you money. The bad news is that you are not the only one looking for money. There are thousands of startups that are looking for money as you, okay? Which are the main funding sources? Just to give you an outlook. Um, you can look for different kind of money. I don't know how much you're acquainted with them, but what we talked before about was equity capital. So the money for boosting the growth, especially for the early stage startups, can be equity capital. Equity capital, we can see also this later, is money that are put into the company as nomin uh, nominal capital. And basically, the investors are becoming shareholders of the company, okay? So they are taking the risk of the ventures alongside with entrepreneurs. Then you have in this spectrum debt capital, which is more classical, which is the bank, okay? Or other financial intermediaries that are giving you the money and you need to repay back this money. Could be a loan and could be other kind of, you know, um, debt money that you may have in mind, okay? Especially for if, because most of you are in the early stages, usually it's very difficult for you to take debt capital. Why? It's difficult because banks usually would like to have guarantees, would like to see that the startups have an historical uh, specific, uh, you know, data that can show that the startups are able to repay the specific uh, uh, monthly um, installments that the bank are asking for repay the debt. So usually if you are incorporated uh, in the last year or if you don't have specific revenues or your cash flow is poor, then it's very difficult to debt. It's the bank is giving you some loan, for example. But you know, this is another option for you. Then you have the guarantees. Um, I don't know if, you know, for example, in Italy, there are different, uh, you know, public bodies that are helping startups in uh, raising money through uh, the bank. Uh, this is happening through guarantees. Basically, the public body is guaranteeing the, this, um, you know, company for raising money in front of the bank. These are very helpful because these are putting uh, in the condition for the startups to receive money from the debt capital. Um, I don't know if in your countries this is happening, but usually this is something very useful for because you know the public stakeholder is helping the startups in receiving money from the banks. Then you have subsidies, which are grants. I'm pretty sure in your you know country there are a lot of you know uh, national agencies, public bodies, or whatever that it's helping you receiving these grants at the national level, but also at the European level. And usually grants are money that you are receiving and you know to repay back. If you're speaking about, you know, European Commission, there are different kinds of programs. It could be, you know, in this case, Horizon Europe, if you're part of one of these projects, you may receive money and then you need to report the money and you receive the money back. From the financial point of view, Horizon Europe is giving you an advance payment, 80% of the uh, budget that you are in the in the consortium, for example, and then the other twenty percent are based on the reporting period. It's very useful because it's money that it's not uh, you need to, to not repay, and you not need to sell part of your company as in the equity capital. Last but not least, tax relief, of course, if this is something when you know from the tax point of view, especially in Italy, if just spending, for example, research and development and you need to, to spend this amount of money for investing in that area, then, uh, for example, you can have the tax relief of a specific percentages, and then you can bring this money back when you are, need to pay the taxes uh, for the 
uh, tax uh, uh, auditor. Again, always different kind of sources of capital that are helping you for growing, but again, different kind of instructions of, let's say, ways that this money uh, are working. Um, do not underestimate the non-financial support that some stakeholders can give you. Um, all these kind of five, let's say, um, sorts of money are financials, meaning that we spoke about uh, the money that you can have in your bank account, how this money has been received from your site. But what is very important is the not financial support, which means that some of these players, especially the equity players, can give you support, which is very powerful, especially in the early stage. For example, introducing you to new customers, introducing you to new advisors, introducing you to, I don't know, distributors, which at again, at entry level, at seed level could be crucial because again, you are in a phase where you need to test all your assumptions and having somebody on board, which brings you the network, it's very relevant. A big suggestion is do not just focus on one of these uh, sources, meaning, okay, you realize that you need a specific amount of money. Do not focus only on one search. You can also uh, diversificate your approach. So I need a, a one million for growing and for reaching the next milestone. Maybe I can look for half million for the from the equity, and then the other half million I can get through. I don't know uh, um, a European project, so subsidies, grants, and then one million is achieved. This is up to you, but again, when looking at the perspective of raising money. Be open and balance all the pros and cons of the each of these sorts of capital. These are the main differences. But just to you know remark, debt capital, equity capital are the opposite of the spectrum. Debt capital, the banks, they're asking the money back. They are not supporting you because basically the bank is just looking if you are paying every month installments. And then of course. The bank, it's not, uh, you know, being shareholders. So basically, you will not have uh, them uh, pushing you in the direction of the company. But it's very important that you need to have guarantees. If, because you are a young startup and you not have the right cash flow that is supporting and showing that you can pay back the storm, and basically they are asking for personal guarantee, your home, for example. Equity capital, the opposite. Um, the investors are becoming your shareholder. So basically, this amount of money, it's not a liability. It's becoming part of your equity of the startup and uh, you are selling part of your company. Um, what is very important is that you will have these investors inside the board of directors, which means one of the representatives of the investors is part of the directors usually, and then you need to uh, have a sort of marriage with this investor, okay? Of course, the main advantage is that they are not asking the money back every month as the, as the bank, because this is equity money. So there is no obligation for you to pay back. Of course, we will see this later. They, these kind of investors are asking you for an exit moment in a specific time frame when they're able to get the money back. But there is no obligation, like for example, for the debt capital, okay? Usually debt, debt capital, it's more for stable growth company or more mature company, equity capital for more fast growth companies that are in, in the early stages. Then you have guarantee subsidies and other, so, you know, just not to cover again, but you know, I will, sh I will share with you the slides, but we will just uh, explain this before. Again, do not underestimate the non-financial support. I don't know how many of you passed through an incubator's process or you know the you know this kind of clustering networking. But again, some investors, some you know stakeholders that we presented before can put into the table not only money, but also again, as I said, the network clustering, uh, personal contacts, which again at the early stages, as you are, are crucial. 
So, um, what is very important in this, uh, you know, slide that I would like uh, to remark uh, when choosing the right mix of financing, consider all the kind of choices that you can achieve uh, and you can take into consideration. Another tip is money is very important, especially at the startup stage, but do not underestimate the non-financial support. Because you may receive also 1 million euro, but then if you don't have, you know, are able to reach customers, are able to reach distributors or whatever, then, you know, money is useful, but not it's not everything. So maybe having some money, giving you also maybe 1 million plus the contacts, it's even powerful. And strategically, it's smarter from your side. Remember, because this kind of money, which is giving you not support, uh, non-financial support, it's called smart money. Because, you know, it's giving you another level of support on top of the money in your bank account. Um, a relevant tip at this point is we discussed, I tried to present you the main aspects of this uh, uh, investors, what is relevant when you're fundraising uh, is that you understand properly which are the expectations, the requirements of each investors. And then when you are preparing for fundraise, you need to ask yourself, I understand correctly which are the expectations, which are these expectations. And then you need to work to meet and match these expectations. Because if since the scratch, you know that you are not able, for whatever reason, to meet these expectations, then it's no sense for you to continue to chase the specific investor, okay? It's very relevant. Know very well who, which are the main rules, expectations from a specific investor. Again, this is the risk capital investment. Um, I don't know how many of you are acquainted about risk capital investment? If you ever received uh, an investment from uh, this kind of investors, in case, please, you know, you can share your experience. It would be very relevant. But what is it? Basically, is when you're receiving money in exchange of a specific percentage of shares of your company. Okay? So it's very important that you are selling part of your company. This must be clear. Who are the main actors in this kind of investment area? In the early stage, could be individuals like business angels, high net worth people, which is investing personal money for being part and support startups, or could be financial company, asset management company, venture capitalist that are managing funds, that are focused on early stage investments. When these kind of investors can uh, uh, enter in the process, well, alongside all the spectrum of the startup stages from the pre-seed till uh, the mature stage, because there are different kinds of investors, business angels, again, and early stage funds are more in the seed stage, but also private equity, for example, are always risk capital investors, but they are supporting mature companies that uh, you know are looking for a lot of money. Why? Which is the main reason these investors are putting the money in, in startups for making profit. This is the main reason. So you need to have this clear in mind that they, the investors, would like to make a profit. And how they can make a profit is a certain point. Once they become your shareholders, usually in five, six years since the moment of the investment, they would like to have an exit phase where basically you as an entrepreneur will give the money back to this shareholder. How you can do this? 90% of the time in Europe, this is happening to a trade sale. This means that you as an entrepreneur will need to sell your company to a bigger one. Um, this must be very clear in mind because you have not the 
uh, obligation to pay this money back. But having investors, being your shareholder, they will start to press you because they need to generate a profit with your investment. So this is very relevant because if you as an entrepreneur um, do not want to have an exit because you want not to want to sell your company. In Europe, again, 90% of the time, this is happening through trade sale. You need to sell your company to another one for generating an exit phase where all the shareholders are becoming richer because maybe, you know, your company worth uh, 1 billion euro. But then, uh, you know, if you're not prone to do this because you would like to keep and guide your company, I don't know, for the next 45, 50 years, you know, then maybe venture capital and especially risk capital investment, it's not your best option, okay? So you need to consider this. That's why the tip before it's understand properly who is the, which are the main uh, rules, the main uh, expectations that you need to follow. Again, these are examples from, uh, you know, uh, in different stages, how the risk capital industry is working. Uh, so you can see from the early stage precede, uh, angel investing uh, can invest between 20K and 200K. Then you have more seed level where you have both business angels and venture capitalists uh, and business angel network, which are syndicating, uh, which could invest up to 1.5 million. Then of course you will have later stage, uh, which can, you know, start to become a bigger ticket of investments where you have both VC in a later stage, but also private equity when you are in the growing stage. Second tip is do not talk with strangers. Again, this means um, do not focus on investors, which are not, you know that you cannot match properly their expectations. And this is very linked to the first one. If you know that this is not the best option for you for whatever reason, because you cannot match these expectations and you are not prone to accept these rules, then do not go for this. Because otherwise it's a waste of time. Time is very precious search for your startup. So understand the rules. And if you can accept the rules and you met the expectations, go on. Otherwise do not accept and do not consider that search of money. Business angels see the... Uh, um, venture capitalist. The main difference is that business angels are individual, investing their own money. While they're doing this, profit, but also because they would like to support early stage uh, entrepreneurs, because maybe they are, you know, in the past they have a big uh, background of, uh, you know, relevant experience in big industries, and they would like to support uh, the new generation of entrepreneurs. Vice versa, venture capitalists are uh, companies asset management company, which are investing uh, limited partners' money, so other investors' money. So for them, it's crucial, the profit, because they need to, to give back the money to their investors increased uh, with a profit. So this is the main difference. But both of them are investing in the early stages. Um, strategically, if you are taking uh, the venture capital industry path because you think, okay, I'm prone to accept the condition of the risk capital industry. I am open to sell part of the uh, company. I think that the non-support, the non-financial support is great. So I would like to chase them. But when you accept these conditions, you need to think who can be the perfect investors in the risk capital industry. Three main tips. Um, look for investors that can support you in the next rounds. What does this mean? Um, usually when you close a round, it takes a lot of time, six months, one year, even more. And uh, what is very important is that uh, if you know that you will raise more money through the equity uh, investors then to save time for the next fundraising and this is a smart approach you need to find since the scratch and investors that uh, it's able with this portfolio 
to put other money into your company because then you are not forced to prepare again another fundraising uh, you know uh, campaign spending a lot of time and whatever so strategically from the scratch try to look at investors which are able to invest also in the other rounds then again always in a smart perspective look for investors that uh, are expert in your field people with experience in this field which can help you to open customers network distributors network or whatever okay then last but not least hands-on approach somebody that it's prone to help you. So if you need the support, if you need, uh, you know, to 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 give uh, this person a call, this person is open to accept this call and support you. So try to avoid people that is just giving you the money, and you know, just uh, looking uh, for reporting issue every I don't know three months or whatever. It's very important at your stage. When you are playing in this field of equity investment, you have two sides in the table. Your side, the entrepreneur, you, what would you like to, you know, to deal with the investor is that you do not want to lose a lot of control of your company. So you will try to minimize the shares that you're giving away. So as you know, let's say the 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 deal uh, when uh, there is a seller and buyer uh, the seller is trying to increase the valuation of the asset in this case the asset is your company so you are trying to push higher the price of your company on the other side you have you know the buyer which is you know the investors try to reduce the risk of your investment that's why it's trying to uh, to lower the price of your company because these investors would like to have an high profit back. It's important that you understand that both you and investors would like to achieve a common goal, which is create value. The creation of value is something crucial, both for you, but also for the investors. So that's why if you properly have the right mindset, both investors and entrepreneurs, then you will see this kind of investment as something very functional because both of you are aiming at creating value, okay? You will, both of you would like to have to increase the valuation of the company. And at a certain point, this is something crucial for you to entrepreneur, you need to accept to have an exit, an exit which aims to have a bigger value than the value that the investors pay to enter your company, okay? But the creation of value it's something that both the entrepreneur and the investors are keen to reach. And this is something you need to understand. Of course, the journey that you need to have uh, with the investors could be not easy because there could be hard moments. But again, both of you are looking for the same goal, create value. Um, which kind of homework you need to, to do to prepare yourself properly for the risk capital industry? You need to prepare a lot, business plan. So you need to have, uh, you know, some pages where you're explaining clearly how you would like to set up your growth strategy. An exactly summary that you can share through mail that can appeal investors to have more information about yourself. Be ready for an elevator pitch. So we will see this, uh, you know, next uh, next week. Something in five minutes, three minutes that are able to get the attention of the investors. And then do not talk with strangers again. Choose specific sorts of investment, which you understand properly, which are the expectations, and you know you can match the expectations. Um, do you have questions so far about all this, uh, you know, discussion around uh, risk capital investment? No, apparently you have been super clear, Lorenzo. Okay. <laughs> but again, please interrupt me eh, if you have <laughs> doubts or whatever. Okay. Thank you. Once you said, okay, uh, I would like to go through a specific series of investment. 
risk capita. And then you understand that, okay, this could be the right kind of investors that they would like to have on board. Then another question is when? So which is the best moment for me to raise money for my startup? Um, uh, some you in the industry said that you need to raise money when you don't need it. Because it's very relevant, this kind of you know approach. Because I as I was saying at the start, if you are raising money, when you realize that you can pay the expenses of your startup for the next three months, let's say, then you are putting yourself in a position to accept bad conditions in the deal. Because you are not in the position, you know, to, to refuse the money or the condition that an investor is giving you. Because you have just three months of uh, time to cover the expenses. And from the financial point of view, this is crucial. So our, you know, experience when, you know, we go through the investment of startups and we support the startups in growing, uh, we always suggest to start to look for money when at least you have one year of runaway. Um, I don't know how many of you are acquainted with the concept of runaway, but uh, runaway is basically is the life expectancy of the company from the financial, from the cash flow point of view. In this line, there is an example that you can find. So um, you need to look at you need to look at your cash flow, and if you know, for example, that uh, you are burning each month hundred thousand euro, and you have in your bank account. 700,000, then of course, you know that you have the possibility to financial sustain your company for the next seven months, okay? Because each month you're burning 100K. This is crucial to know. And I am scared and we are scared a lot of time when we are talking with entrepreneurs, they do not know which is their runaway in the company. So I don't know if I'm asking to some of you or if you'd like to reply, do you know which is your runaway or which is your monthly burn rate for your startup? Do you know this? How much money you're burning? Or maybe if you're not burning any more money. So did you do you know this as an entrepreneur? It's something that you're tracking. It's something that you're not carrying. Again, a big suggestion is track this. Because otherwise, you know, it's like the fuel in uh, in the the oil in the in the in the car. If you're not tracking the you know the spy and you know the the these kind of things, then you know at a certain point the car will stop. And the same the you know your company. Track this specific, you know. Uh, runaway ratio and the burn rate, the monthly burn rate of your startup. And at least one year before that you know that your bank account is going to be empty, please start to think about how to raise money. Um, it's very important, again, from always from the risk capital investment perspective, then you need to put you in the best position to raise money for the with the best conditions to show investors that <clears throat> you achieved relevant milestones so far. <clears throat> what does it, it mean? Basically, it shows to investors that you are properly executing the business plan. At this stage, investors, especially seed, pre-seed stage, they are investing in people, in the team, because basically your company is empty. You don't have asset. You don't have, you know, an historical data or a big portfolio of customers. You're an empty, uh, you know, box. But what is making the difference? 
And the main decision, the main driver they are putting the money in the startup is the people. And if you show that as team you achieved the relevant milestones with a low budget, then it's very relevant for you that your um, your startup is doing the right things. Okay. So, which are the main categories of uh, traction, product, service? You're showing that your technology readiness level is high. It's ready to be sell, sold in the market. Then sales and business development. Again, if you have startup selling, I don't know, software, and you show that each month you're selling already, I don't know, 1,000 monthly recurring revenue, and this it's increasing uh, on a monthly basis of 20%, uh, then you're showing a specific pathway, okay? A strong pathway. Um, going back to the question of this uh, section, when you are supposed to raise money, or which is the best moment for you to raise money, um, try always to raise money from investors once you achieve the the inflection points. What does uh, inflection point mean? Uh, basically, inflection point are the main milestone in your entrepreneurial journey that you'd like to achieve. So let's say I would like to have a TRL 9 of the product uh, you know, in the next six months. Then after six months, I would like to start to sell in the, to the, the customers. Then uh, after one year, I would like to have a growth of sales of sales of I don't know thirty percent. This kind of milestones. The best moment to, to to raise money is after you reach this milestone. Why? Because then the conditions that you're presenting to the investors are different. You can have a higher price of the company, better condition, and from the entrepreneur point of view, is the best. Vice versa, if you start to raise money before reaching this milestone, your traction is perceived as less, your risk is higher, and so the value of your company is less. And so the conditions for you are worse, okay? It's very important then that uh, when you are raising your money, you are able to raise after this impact uh, uh, inflection points, and then what is very important is that you are uh, um, able to have the enough money for reaching the next inflection point, the next milestones, okay? That's why a big suggestion is when you're calculating the amount of money you will need for the next uh, one year, because in one year you know that you reach the next milestone, always put the 20% more. 30% more. Why? Because it's sort of buffer for you for the emergency, for something that you not foresee. Okay? And I think this is very, very crucial for you. Um, this is just, again, to remark that it takes time. This is the process that you need to pass through for raising money. So there are different stages. The stage zero, you start to make your plan of fundraising. Stage one, you start to contact investors. Then uh, there is the due diligence phase. Then there is negotiation, deal making. Then you close finally, and then you receive the money. Um, it's a very long process, especially from the stage one till the stage four. It takes, again, also one year of time. That's why going back, always look for money, for risk capital money, at least one year and months of your runaway. Um, again, before starting next section, doubts, questions around uh, which is the best moment when you should raise risk capital money from investors. Okay, so we can move uh, in the section of how much money. 
Um, always these sections are very linked. Uh, the best um, amount of money you can raise is the one that you can foresee, can help you to reach the next inflection point, the next milestone, main milestone. Um, this is very important because if you're able to reach the next main milestone, then you're putting yourself in a position to deal the next uh, uh, fundraising in a better way. Um, this is what I said. It's very important that you have a roadmap. What I mean with roadmap, it's a plan where you are writing down all the main milestones that you would like to achieve with your startups. Then uh, once you have these milestones, you need to estimate when you're able to reach them. And each fundraise need, needs to help you at least uh, with, to reach at least one milestone. Better if two but at least one. So it's very important that in this roadmap that you have, you estimate the time frame and you understand which is the main, the main next milestone. And in this perspective, it's very crucial that you estimate all the amount of money that you need for reaching this milestone. So this is an example. A very simple example, I would say, just to make the things clear. So if this is, you know, uh, uh, just to give you the context, if you are in a pre-revenue stage, so you are not selling your product deal, you are burning rate, you have a burning rate of 10K each month, okay? Then to reach the next milestones, Milestone, which is the version bet of the product and the first group of early adopters, you estimate that you need to hire two senior software developers. So that will cost you 5K each month. One senior business developer, which costs you 5K. And marketing expenses that you may estimate in 15K. Um, to release the beta version and to reach 10 early adopters, you estimate that this process will take 18 months. So given this context, how much money should you raise? So is there some money I would like to take this question? Some volunteer. Try to not to make the math exercise to heal, but <laughs> okay. So um, what do you need to do is basically it's you are having 15k plus 10k of the developers, which are 25k. Okay. Then 25k, you need to sum the actual burn rate of 10k, the actual structure. So that will lead the 35K, okay, each month. And then you need to multiply this uh, um, 35K for 18, okay, which leads more or less to 630K. So more than half a million. So you will need to raise more than half a million for making this plan happening. A tip from my side is add a 20% more because maybe the expenses you estimated are too low. So there are some unforeseen expenses that you need to face, okay? So include always a buffer because this will help you to be in a safer position, helps you to have money in your bank account that will lead you to the next milestone, okay? Um. What you need to be aware about when, again, always in the perspective of risk capital investment, it's the 
dilution. This means how you as a founder, how much part of the company, how much, how many shares you will own as a shareholder. This is a mere table to show some average statistics that can happen. So when you have your startup with your founders without having raised money, you have 100% of the company, you and your founders. Usually in a seed stage already, you need to sell away the 25% of the company. Then in the Series A, you will, you will uh, need to sell the other 25%. So you see that in two rounds, on average, you can own just the 50% of your company. And then the more, of course, you proceed, uh, the more you need to, to be diluted. But, uh, but uh, do not be scared. Because in each of these rounds, the value, the creation of value of your company should increase. Should. Yes, it's not always happening. But if you will own, just say in the CSC, a 20% of the company that is worth uh, 3 billion, it's always better, much better than owning the 75 or the 100% of a company which is just, uh, val you know, uh, it's valuing uh, 1 million. I understand from your perspective that you do not want to give away a lot of your company, but if you're taking this journey of risk capital investment, think about this. Again, you maybe do not need the five, six rounds, but if this is the case, consider that the more rounds, the more dilution, because you are selling away part of your company. This is just to be aligned with the market. So just to share you some figures, I don't know how many of you are uh, acquainted about what's happening in the market, but this is just something that you can download from PitchBook, which is a very relevant uh, database for you know data around uh, you know startups, and uh, especially this was from 2021, so it's pretty updated. But just to give you an uh, an idea of which is the average of equity that you need to sell into a seed round. Um, Again, this is based on European startups. Um, what's happening, what, what was happening in 2021 is that uh, early stage startups was raising on average 1.1 million as ticket, meaning uh, an early stage startup was raising 1 million money on average. And the investors on average were having as evaluation of these startups 4 million this means that before investing, investors, when starting to make a deal with the entrepreneurs, were saying, we are valuing your startup 4 million euro. Then this means that technically speaking, the value, the value of the company, once the investors were in, is the sum of the pre-money valuation plus the investment made. In this case, on average, was 5 million. This means that if you need to estimate the average shares that have been uh, sold for the investors, this is a simple calculation, meaning that you need to take the value of the company, the post money valuation, and you need to consider the ticket that was invested by the investors. This means that the investors need to own 1 million out of the 5 million valuation. And this means technically that the average shares that the investors were aiming at was 21%. This means that on average, in the seed round, European investors were asking for the 21% of your company. It's too much for you, then in case Again, always consider that, you know, other kind of sorts of money. But again, if you're asking for risk capital investment and you are not accepting to sell away 21%, but just the 5% of your company in a seed stage, then maybe it's not sense for you to proceed. In the market, was happening this in 2021, okay? 
Um, I think that okay, but you know we don't. Um, I do not include the slides for the Euro, the the U.S. market. The U.S. market is the same. Maybe they have a bigger ticket, a bigger pre-money valuation, but the concept is that investors are always asking for the twenty percent. This means that if again you are not prone to accept twenty percent of your company to be sold away, then you know try to look for other sources of money because these are the conditions, these are the standards happening in the market. Um, these are another tip, uh, always looking at what's happening uh, in, in the market and, you know, just to give you some statistics. Uh, um, the question is how much money I need to raise. We said enough money to, to reach the next milestone, but, you know, it's always helpful uh, from the time frame point of view that at least uh, you try to raise uh, money that help you to go through the next 15, 18 months. Why? Because it takes time to prepare a fundraising, as we said, from the risk capital perspective for these kind of investors. And if you raise money that helps you to survive for the next six months, for example, then uh, once you have this money in the bank account, you need to start to look for other money. Because you know that you have just six months of runaway. So the best perspective is at least 15, 18 months. Um, these are some examples in this table, some startups. Um, as you see, there are very few examples that were looked that raised money that uh, uh, supported them for, I would say, short term, six, eight months. Most of them were looking at least for uh money that can let them to survive more than 15 months. Okay, so there is at least uh, one that raised money for uh, 35 months of runaway. This is an expected you know, burn rate that they calculated, but you know, always a good suggestion is add the 20% as buffer to calculate the runaway because forecasts are not always exact. 100% they're wrong, okay? And you have to add something more. Um, another tip is when you're raising money in front of risk capital investors, try to be as much consistent as possible. Consistent with the financials, so your forecast, because you know in your forecast there are all the runaways, all the bond rates, all the expected revenues growth, uh, the investments that you need to make. Uh, so all the figures are telling me what you said in words. And then the roadmap. You need to have a roadmap, as I said before. All the, if the roadmap is crucial for understanding the milestones, the time frame, and the amount of money you need to raise for the next round. Um, these are logical steps. These logical steps we already discussed these in the previous slide for making a consistent fundraising plan. First question: Which are the next milestones we would like to achieve with this money, with this round? Which are the investment I need to make to achieve these milestones? Three, how much money I'm burning to face the investment for reaching this milestone? How many months we will need for achieving these milestones? And then you add a buffer, the 0.5, rescue months we call it, but it's a percentage that you need to calculate on top. And then you can start to calculate the amount of money thanks to this data. And then you ask yourself, okay, I estimate that I need 630K as the example before, which is the best source of money? Can I go through Horizon Europe? Can I go through risk capital industry investors? Can I go through a grant? It's up to you. But to make a fundraising plan consistent and to establish the money you need, go through these seven steps. Okay. Questions, doubts? About how much money, all these kind of statistics that we really, you know, try to present to make you aware about it works in the market for the risk capital industry.
I don't see any question. Okay. So I think everything is, is clear. Okay. Right. I hope okay. so, at least for uh, all of our uh, startup friends here with us today. Okay. So maybe we can move in this uh, section about prepare an equity fundraising, always in the perspective, okay, you pick up the equity uh, investors, again, which are at your specific, uh, you know, stage, because you are in a seed stage, the more prone to invest money. Again, banks, the debt, uh, if you're in a seed stage, could be very difficult, very, very difficult. So how to prepare an equity fundraising? Um, you need to, to look at this as a numbers game. So you need to talk with a lot of investors. Um, a lot of investors means that there is a rule of thumb in the industry that there is a 5% hit rate, meaning that only the 5% of the investors you are pitching to will commit themselves to give you money. So if your goal is to have 10 business angels that are committed, that on the table put the offer to give you money, then you need to have a pitch to 200 business angels. This must not be scaring you, but this is the truth. Because maybe, again, you are an outlier that you can be the one that with uh, five, six pitches can have five, six, you know, offers in the table. But usually this is not happening. So that's why be prepared to speak with a lot of investors, okay? Take this hit rate, 5% of hit rate as a, a rule when you are estimating uh, how long should be the list of investors. Then uh, what's happening is you as an entrepreneur with your co-founders should look and scout for investors. When I said scouting, investors you need to look for potential investors that are matching your profile what does it mean each investors in the risk capital industry may have a different sweet spot this means a different value proposition giving the money and this sweet spot is composed by different kind of criteria the target market, so again, maybe they are more focused uh, on, uh, you know, healthcare, they are focused on digital, they are focused on uh, deep tech, they are focused on whatever. Stage of maturity, they are uh, investing in seed stage, they are investing in late stage, they are investing in other stages of the startups. Business model, they are, I don't know, uh, is an investors that is looking for um, software startups because they are just investing for startups with subscription business models. They are looking for, I don't know, uh, startups that uh, they are uh, more focused on uh, the hardware business model, meaning transactional. They can be focused also on a specific business model. Tickets, this means how much money they are investing on average. They can just invest up to, I don't know, half million or they can invest up to three million. And this is a completely different story. Geography, it could be also that some investors are investing only in Europe or in Italy, or they're focusing just on US or whatever. Last but not least, impact investors. They could be also investors that are looking for other, uh, let's say, uh, things, not only the financial return, but also the impact. So I'm thinking about you know environmental impact investors that they are looking also for startups helping them to achieve a saving of, I don't know, CO2 of a specific amount of um, quantity. Why it's important that you focus and you um, specifically monitor this, because if your startup, it's not matching their sweet spot, they, it's no sense for you to chase them. Save your time, scout the investors and Put in the list only those that you think are matching your profile. Okay. Um, 
relationship building is crucial. Um, this means that you need to start create relationships. Also, when uh, you are looking for another level of money, this means that once you are raising your seed stage uh, round, then uh, you can start to talk also with uh, the ones that uh, are in a mature level. Why? Because usually when you keep them in the loop of your startup, of the updates of your startup, then uh, you are putting them in a potential pipeline when you will raise the next, uh, the next round of money. Okay? And uh, this is pretty crucial because, um, as I was saying, it takes time to raise money. And if you are having already future investors in the loop of your startup, a suggestion that we see a lot of time is add investors in a newsletter, just a newsletter focused to investors' relation. And we sometimes receive also uh, this kind of newsletter where there are startups that are updating each month or a quarterly basis what they achieved. Why it's important? Because I am in the loop as investors. And if I'm an investor that it's entering in a mature stage, but I am already in the loop when they are at this stage, I can have information, I can see, and I can track how the startup is evolving. And it's a win-win situation. So the suggestion is focus on those that are, can give you the money for the next round, but start also to make relationship for the next rounds after, for example, the seed. It's crucial because having this approach is smarter and can save you a lot of time. Um, don't burn bridges, meaning uh, the venture community, it's very small usually, okay? So in the industry, there are not, uh, you know, millions of uh, uh, companies, venture capitalists or business angels. So the community usually is small, you know, uh, especially I'm thinking in Italy, but apart maybe the US where it's very big, you know, in the other market could be relatively small. And so I think that... Uh, the relationship that you are building with uh, the people, because again, uh, venture capital is made by people, it's crucial. And if you are not uh, transparent, if you are not behaving in the proper way, you're having uh, a big damage in, in return to your uh, you know, specific person. And then uh, do not think that this is not going uh, to uh, then to, you know, to damage you for the other rounds. No, it happened once that, you know, there was a founder that was not acting, uh, you know, transparently, that uh, at a certain point when, you know, uh, there was another investor that was prone to give the money to him, then uh, in the industry, they were talking in, a, in an event, uh, in a working event, and another investor said, you know, what was the behavior? And then, you know, this kind of things uh, then uh, take the deal to not closing. Again, it's very crucial always from your side to be transparent and honest because this will repay also for the next rounds. Um, a first crucial step is map your contact. Uh, this means that how you can best reach the lead uh, for raising money, the investors, <laughs> which is very important is avoid to have uh, cold email. So do not start to write in LinkedIn or whatever kind of info uh, contact, uh, you know, that you are raising money because cold email are having 1% of replies. So you need to don't know to send the trillions of email for reaching a good level. The best way is a warm introduction. How you can get warm introduction in the risk capital industry? Usually look around for your social, LinkedIn, Facebook, and see. And when you're looking for a specific person, for a specific business angel or venture capitalist, if this person have some contacts sharing with you, 
So if there are contacts that you know are have been shared together with this person, then maybe reach out the contacts that you have in common and ask these people if they can make an intro to this person. Because this is the best way for having a warm intro. Or maybe you can look at the business angel of venture capitalist portfolio companies, because if you Google the business angel or the, or the venture capitalist, they have a website. In the website, there are the portfolio companies. And then you can look if the portfolio companies, maybe you know some founders of these portfolio companies. And then you can ask the other founders to make an intro to them. It's very important because then you are able to have a warm introduction to this kind of uh, investors that you are keen to have uh, in the pipeline. Then it's very important that you set up a specific, uh, you know, system for tracking uh, all the uh, discussion with investors. You can use different tools. Uh, there are Founder Suite, uh, Salesforce, sort of, sort of CRM. You can also use a simple Excel file. But the best way is track, because a lot of time. If you're not tracking or if you're just using email outlook, you are losing uh, uh, the last uh, contact you had, uh, which were the next steps. If you have this uh, specifically tracked in a file, it's always better because it can help you to move along the process in a more professional way. A lot of time, in my experience, when I was contacting or I tried to was contacted and I start to deal with the founder, you realize immediately who is going take this seriously or having a you know a, a, a strong process. A lot of time it happens that you know you receive emails saying, okay, by tomorrow I will send you a pitch deck with uh, you know the smart executive summary, and then they never come back. Again, reputational point of view, it's not so good. If you are saying something or you're promising something, stick it. Try to set up a process that helps you to follow this. Or a lot of times they're coming back one month later. But again, I'm investing in people. And if I need to have a rule of thumb that helps me to have the first, let's say, um, break the deal moment, I follow this approach. Okay, the ones that are promising something or in the first approaches are saying a specific deadline. They're not meeting this deadline, you know. You know, they are out in this process, at least for this uh, first stage. Because I can trust somebody that it's not able to meet the easy deadlines to send a pitch when, uh, if I am a shareholder, that we need uh, to sell, I don't know, one million uh, in the market. Um, prepare your pitch and material. Get prepared. This was one of the first slides we saw together. Minimum document, pitch deck, executive summary, financial forecast. These are the minimum one. Of course, better if you have also a business plan, something that is more, um, let's say, texty. In the first approach, it's enough pitch deck and executive summary. Um, it's very important that you are setting up a data room. If you are in a fundraising process and you need to talk with uh, hundreds of investors and Avoid to send in all emails attachments. Set up a visual data room. It can be through specific software. It can be in your Google Drive or whatever. In this room, you will give access to investors to see the main documents that you would like to share with them. Maybe you can have a virtual data room for different stages. Stages uh, of the first approach, pitch tech, executive summary. Stages where you're more into diligence, where you're sharing more in detailed information. It's very important to structure this kind of uh, common uh, uh, folder that you are able to share with investors. It's also a more professional way, okay? So uh, this is an example of, you know, how to start having conversations, uh, um, especially through a warm introduction. As I, I was saying before, if you can have a person introducing you to the investors, it's always better. So um, you can... This is an example. You can write the specific connector from that you know, asking, uh, you know, uh, I need to raise this amount of money and uh, I saw that in LinkedIn you have this connection. Can you please introduce me to this person? Then uh, uh, he said, yes, no problem. Uh, maybe you can ask also this person to make an introduction and you can share 
a specific uh, short template of uh, email that it's helpful for uh, the connector to share with investors. Because again, it's it must be something crunchy. So uh, I am, I don't know, uh, Lorenzo, and you know, I'm raising this amount of money for this company. We are this kind of company. We're making these things better than competitors, and we achieve this kind of milestone in the next, uh, in the last three months. I would like to have, uh, you know, a quick chat with you to understand if there could be, you know, a potential, uh, you know, deal. Uh, thanks. Very simple email that the connector can share. Um, the best then way for you to get the momentum of, uh, you know, generate momentum around your fundraising is uh, having a lot of meetings. So every day, every week, you need to be full of meetings when you're in fundraising process. And what is very important, always keep the track of what must happen after the meeting. This means that, okay, um, I had a meeting with these investors, so I need to track somehow, and again, maybe in the software or an Excel file, uh, what was the interest level, if they're interested or not, and which are the next steps. So I need to contact him back. I need to wait two weeks before the reply. It's very important that you need to track because the next, the next things to do are crucial. Um, Follow-up email. It's crucial to receive feedback from investors. In the risk capital industry, there are you know a different kind of perspective around this because sometimes people are saying that you know the feedback of investors are not true. Somebody is saying uh, they are you know very rare, but uh, the ones that are giving you feedback it's crucial. Again, our approach is try always to send feedback email. Um, follow up uh, three times usually in, in a period of one month. Do not send everyday mails asking for feedback, but you know, on average, one every 10 months and maximum three times, because after three times, this investor is not replying, you know, just give up. Um, closing a deal, it's like a marathon, especially, you know, in the risk capital industry. Um, these are some tips for, uh, you know, succeeding and arriving, uh, you know, to the last mile. After 20 meetings, you're understanding if your uh, round is generating interest, okay? If you are an average of 5 to 10% ratio of pitches to commitments, this means that, as I was saying, out of 100 of investors you talk to, five commit their money to your company, you are on the average, so you are, go you are doing in the right way. But after 50 investors, you are not received a commitment and interest, maybe it's time to regroup and think and start to think why it's not working. Maybe you need to have more traction. So you need to work more on your business and try to get more traction or trying to find the round bridge or maybe put some money from shareholders, existing ones to achieve the next milestone and then come back to the investors. And then uh, try to put always investors in a competition. The more deals you have on the table at the same time, the better the conditions you can raise. But I think, you know, the deals and negotiation. Last but not least, uh, fundraising is a full-time activity. If you are the CEO of the startup, you need to do only this. Meaning 99% uh, of your time, 90% of your time should be committed to fundraise. Update documents, meeting investors, follow up with investors, these kind of things. Doubts, questions?